Hi, it's James here from the Sprinkle Donut Forge in Moscow, Texas, and uh, I'm going to make a tool today. You ever see those neat looking square holes you see punched in gate hardware and uh, old implements and such? And the square hole in the nail header from my live stream? Well, I use this. This is an old star drill. And I made this little square punch out of it. It distorts badly, requires a lot of dressing. But it'll only make so big of a square hole. And being that it's a very narrow shaft, I want something a little beefier. So, I have a 9 inch piece of this. And if you'll do a quick web search on that number, you'll see that this is an old military lug wrench bar, socket wrench bar, which is very, very hard steel. Um, it's got a nice heft to it. Let me ring it for you. Rings. Anyway, I broke this. I had forged it into a little uh, bottom fuller, and I quenched it too hard and didn't heat treat it properly, and it failed and broke. I had a little curved part. I've cut that off. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a beefier square punch slash drift uh, that I can uh, make and enlarge square holes with for things such as uh, carriage bolts. You see that square lug on the back of that carriage bolt head? Ideal if you have a square hole punched you can use this. It holds itself while you attach the nut and washer. So uh, I'm going to get this in the fire, get it hot, and we'll get started. See you in a minute. All right, here goes. Brush some of the scale off so they don't go flying around. First thing I'm going to do is transform this into a square. It doesn't yield as much as miles do. Now use higher carbon steel as you got to make sure you maintain enough heat to move them. But you can see it's becoming a square. Uh, I'm not worried about that rag on the end. I can hot rest that. Anyway, that's way bigger than what I'm going for, so let's get it back in. See you in a minute. All right, let's pull it. Go from the big end. Sure to turn a full 90 degrees. Do not go from the little end up. You will create a divot in the end and will lose stock.
and if you don't turn the uh, billet a full 90 degrees hammering back and forth you'll end up with a trapezoid rather than a square shape and that's really difficult to correct can be done but you'll beat yourself silly trying to do it okay the heat's going away I'm not going to try to force it uh, hopefully you can see what I'm trying to do here get in nice and square so far no sharp corners drawing it down to a smaller square point my goal is about 5 16 to 3 8 of an inch on the very end and you can see the end is still relatively flat because I'm not trying to form this smaller and then work this out because that would sink the center in and create a divot here. We place it in the fire. Now when you're using a solid fuel forge such as coal, charcoal, whatever you use for your solid fuel, you have to think of your fire in a shape and think of where the air is introduced. Um, the word oxidize has a lot to do with oxygen, has everything to do with oxygen. So at the lower part where the oxygen is being introduced into the fireball, if you think about a pineapple shape or a football shape, rather an elongated oval, the bottom of that pineapple it's got a lot of oxygen. So if you sink your steel down to where there's an oxidizing heat, it will be more apt to burn, especially if you're working with a higher carbon steel, such as what I'm working with now. Um, if you put it too high in the pineapple, or the shape of your fire, rather, uh, you're not gonna get enough heat to really forge or weld or anything like that. Uh, it'll just kinda glow and real hard to work with you've got to find the happy medium get in there in the middle where you still got extreme heat at the nucleus of where it's the hottest but most of the oxygen is burned off feeding the fire so you've got what uh, welders refer to as a neutral flame or a neutral heat so you can get the heat that you need without oxidizing and burning or pulling up short of forging heat. So you have gotta get that happy medium and think about working your hot spots in that way and uh, controlling your fire. Fire control is very important in a solid fuel forge. You gotta play with your fire a little bit. You gotta feed it around where it needs to be fed but don't just dump a heap of fresh green coal on the top of your billet. It's gonna stick to it. You're gonna have nasties to deal with. So if you think about the shape of your actual fire cherry and uh, try not to get it too oxidized or too low for forging, find that happy medium and as that moves in your coal pot, account for it by the, uh, the tending of your forge. So uh, we'll get that hot and we'll get back with it. See you in a minute. Alright, she's hot. Hammer time.
starting to develop some sharp corners. Each knot goes down a little bit. Not too much, just where they're not sharp. So we're getting a good square taper on there. I'll uh, measure that. The height of the taper, we got about, I'd say five eighths of an inch. Down here we've got around three eighths of an inch. I want that a little bit sharper. So we haven't yet created a divot because we're working the metal from thick side to thin. So I'm gonna get it back in there and work this down. We'll see you in a minute. More of the same. Gonna curve when you do this. Just straighten it when you got enough heat. Still no divot. Little planishing while well, I got enough heat. Planishing is knocking down the bumps and ripples and cleaning up your forge work. Okay, that's enough. So now we've got this. We're getting where we want to be. We've got down to about just ahead of a quarter of an inch. See you in a minute. All right, out with it and on with it. Alright, one more heat. 
get that drawn down just a little bit more and this will be good for what I want it for see you in a minute all right move down to the two pound ball peen gives me a little more control Try to make sure it has a good graduation, a good distal taper, as we'll say. This one you have to straighten it. edge is sharp on this forging so it'll make a nice sharp square hole all right there's what I've got and the end of the punch has no divot to speak of and it measures less than a quarter of an inch so that'll be easy enough to drive through hot metal. So I'm going to heat this thing to a critical temperature and quench it in oil first and see if the file skates. And I'll show you if it does or not. See you in a minute. Okay, time for the first quench. I'm going to try canola oil so I don't uh, overly harden the steel. I've got a magnet here. Make sure the steel is non-magnetic, so it's at critical temperature. The oil is not too cold. I'm not worried about hardening the upper part of the shaft, just everything that's square. You do not want to strike a hardened surface. It can chip and cause you some bodily damage and damage your tool as well. The magnet sticks again. Once it is magnetic, it's okay to go ahead and quench it in the water. If I go gentle with that, and I don't want to create a quench line, so I'm just going for the tip, dipping in and out quickly. If you create a quench line, you will create a place where the metal can actually break. So I'm going to move this hot bucket of oil carefully out of harm's way. And we'll see if the file cuts or if it skates. It skates nicely. So that's hardened. So now it's okay to go ahead and quench the whole tool once the entire thing has become magnetic. If you want more information on this, I suggest checking out Christ Centered Ironworks. Uh, Roy Adams over there has a great video on uh, 
heat treating uh, chisel made from coil spring, which 5160 or uh, coil spring material loves to break. Spring steel loves to break. He's had great success. He's a professional blacksmith. I suggest you watch that video. I've shared it many times. If I can find the link or I remember to, I'll share it in the comment section below. Is that cooled off where I can touch it? So the next step is I've got to uh, clean the metal to where I can actually see the shiny metal and uh, I'm going to heat from the struck end up and watch the colors run for which I'm going to employ my uh, colorblind glasses that Alan from Curiosity Forge sent me so I can see the colors run and I'll explain what I'm doing so we'll see you in a minute when I get this all cleaned up alright I cleaned the steel where you can see the shine and uh, by doing that I also finished a little bit of the shaping I wanted and uh, I blunted the struck end and created this little taper around it you don't want any mushrooming because those little mushroomed pieces can chip off and damage you and the tool uh, so what I've got to do now is I've got to place the struck end into the fire to anneal this and harden this it will draw back some of the hardness because once you quench a piece of steel um, that's as hard as it will ever be I could literally put this in the vise hit it with a hammer and snap it clean in two and it will have a grain structure similar to this because this is a piece of this and I know what it'll do I've had experience with this piece of steel um, if you harden a piece of steel by quenching it after its critical temperature, put it in the vise, hit it with a hammer, and it snaps, well you know you got something that will harden to a blade quality or tool quality. Uh, at least in my mind. You can correct me if I'm wrong. So I'm going to put this in there, struck in first. Let this end get softer and watch the colors climb until this one is a light bronze because I want to leave some hardness here and I want to reduce the hardness here. See you in a minute. Well here's my shades from Alan Beasley that allow me to see color. There's the steel face where you can see the the blues and purples starting to run and you can see the bronzes coming in. Oh wow I can see them too. <laughs> That's cool. Anyway you want to get a light straw color here at the end and that will be hard enough for this you're going to ruin your heat treat uh, using it in hot steel so periodically it's not a bad idea to clean your tools up shiny your struck tools like this for work in hot metal and go ahead and uh, heat treat them again now I've got the airflow very low. I've got this fire in idle. That way this climbs slow and it doesn't burn the other end. Because uh, burnt steel will chip just like overly hardened steel will. So you see the, uh, the purple and the blues, all that starting to climb this way. And you see just ahead of it, uh, bronze or light bronze starting to climb towards the tip you don't want to let that get too close um, you want to hold up probably about three quarters of an inch and that'll be fine um, if your tip chips you can grind it back into shape that's no problem but uh, once it reaches the desired uh, consistency here the desired color you need to go ahead and quench it so I've got this to grab the little end and I've got these to grab the big end I'll grab it by the, with the little end and hold on to the big end and quench it in that oil since I've uh, 
discern that this is a properly oil hardening steel so uh, as I've been speaking you've watched these colors run and uh, I hope you can see that right there they're starting to get there okay yeah I think that's good so let's go over to the bucket with it well almost a little more okay cuz it's gonna keep climbing when I pull this out just like bacon keeps frying when you pull it out of the pan notice that's not burning so we're gonna go ahead and quench that in the oil get that quench set I'm going to lean the oil a little bit. That's no further than I will ever use the working portion. So now I'm going to grab it by that end and uh, quench off the really hot end in the oil. Because I know it's below the critical temperature but I'm trying to go soft with it so I don't freeze the molecules in the steel to make it too hard <laughs> that's kind of cool well, you gotta love stuff that's on fire So let's see if a magnet sticks to all of this. Yep, yeah, it's all magnetic. So once it is uh, below critical temperature, it doesn't hurt you to quench the whole tool. But just for safety's sake, I'm going to do it working in first in water. And I'm going to dip it in and out quickly as not to create a quench line and a fault point. Oh, it smells like fried chicken. Yeah, I'm a meativore. I love that stuff. Anyway. Turn it around. Stir it around a little bit. Try to touch it. No, still a little bit warm. Need some more water in my slack tub. It leaks. One second. Be back with you. All right, here is the uh, heat-treated tool. I don't know if you can see the color variation from here to there. See how this is like a light straw and it goes into the purples and blues. And uh, we heated from this end of course. And it's kind of ugly but we can brush that off. But I'll take a file and I'll show you what I'm talking about. It's a good chalked up file. Use chalk on your files. It keeps them from loading up. That cut nicely. So that's kind of annealed, it's soft. Now let's see if we can cut this. That won't bite. Just the same. So we got an end that's safe to strike. And we got an end that's hardened for work. So there you go. There's how to take a piece of hardened steel and create yourself a square punch
you can drift holes out larger with. I suggest working both sides of the hole and punching the slug out back and forth and then you can widen the hole uh, to me it doesn't matter a whole hell of a lot if it's tapered to one side or another as long as the fastener works uh, you can create one that stops at the desired size and then tapers back the other way as a drift you can drive completely through and make a square hole that's square both directions but anyway, that's what I got for tonight. I hope you enjoyed it. Hope you gleaned something from it. Till next time, bye.